Wayne Getz and his team here uh, from the uh, NOVA modeling system. Uh, some very interesting work in uh, simulation modeling. Um, tell us about it, Wayne. Yeah. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, we really appreciate having the invitation to come down. Never been to the campus before, so it was very interesting for us. Um, and thank you, Ching, for organizing all the details. So as you know, we've been involved in this modeling enterprise, which we call NOVA. And uh, the team that we've got here today uh, basically includes myself, Richard, who is the architect of the NOVA platform, Nick, who's been working with NOVA for a long time, uh, John Pataki, who is um, in the software business, service industry, and has had a strong interest in NOVA for the last several years. And also Andy is here, and he's made fantastic contributions to our website and done a lot of the video uh, work online. So if you go to novamodeler.com and you look at the tutorials, Andy produced all those tutorials. So the title of the talk is NOVA, an interactive graphic scripting platform for education and computational research. Uh, the structure of this talk is I'm going to do the motivation and vision part, which shouldn't last too long. Then the heart of the talk will be given by Richard, who will talk about the architecture and some of the innovative aspects of NOVA and how it contributes to computational thinking. And then Nick has got the exciting part, which is really to show how we're using NOVA in education and also as a research tool. So I'm going to talk first about the vision thing. So what is NOVA? NOVA is a platform that is not too specialized. And by that, by that I mean it's not built for a very specific purpose. It's built for a general purpose platform, but it's not going to be too amorphous either because it needs enough structure to facilitate coding by people who have very few coding skills and are basically going to be building their code through a graphical interface. So in a sense, NOVA is just right for the lawless wilds of the applied sciences. So in the applied sciences today, we have a lot of people interested in using computational tools, but who aren't deep coders and actually can't do anything very sophisticated without having coders working with them. So NOVA is really designed for applied scientists to move beyond coding, not to be bogged down by this problem of how to do efficient coding when teaching and developing what I call canonical, and those are uh, teaching models, and also research models. So NOVA is going to supposed to take us the whole spectrum from teaching to research. We think NOVA is a game changer, and I think, and I hope you'll come to the same conclusion after you've seen our presentation today. Um, so in the field of intensive computational approaches in the applied sciences, I always think that this is akin to riding the tiger. So NOVA, uh, computational models can be very, very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. And I think today, in a lot of applied fields, certainly in the field where I am, computational population biology, there's a lot going on that is very unsatisfactory. So we ride the tiger where the law is weak and anything goes. So the uh, Berkeley philosopher of science, Paul Feyerbend, wrote this uh, book against method, a critique of science. And in a sense, if we have a look at what's happening in these applied fields that I've listed up there, you have, instead of having a foundation in the laws of physics that can guide you in your computational thinking and your computational models, we put together ad hoc narratives and the question is, how are we doing science and how is this science? And NOVA is going to help us make it science. My own area is computational population biology. And one of the things we're particularly interested in um, are individuals moving over landscapes. So here we have some yellow individuals, maybe uh, herbivores gra grazing on the landscape and some red individuals that would like to eat these, in these herbivores. And if we build a model of what's going on, we have what I call the inner world and outer world dynamics of our agents. So our agents are in this, these individuals, they organisms, uh, they grow, they have a physiology, 
uh, in terms of disease processes, they have an immunological system, uh, they also have brains, they're making decisions about where to go and what to do, and in order to make these decisions, they have to integrate information in their outer world. So the outer world consists of these circles or kernels that they integrate information over, the information may pertain to the resources they need to live, and also there may be a landscape of fear out there, they have to avoid other individuals, and the landscape structure becomes very important in determining how they should move and what they should do. So this is kind of the level at which I'm interested in applying computational methods and trying to understand how these systems work with application to conservation biology, uh, various e ecological questions. So what struck me very recently was what I, I call a symptomatic case study. And in this case study, I uh, had a colleague who's been building models of animal interactions and the emergence of territoriality. He's particularly interested in the behavior of foxes in Europe, but this can apply to many different systems. And what he's looking at is individuals go around marking territories and other individuals come in, and when they detect these marks, they alter their behavior. And if you model these individuals moving over landscapes and analyze the data, then you get the kinds of territorial structures that you see in this diagram on the left. Interestingly, when I said to him, did you include your code, which in this case happened to be MATLAB, he said, are you crazy? I'm not giving away my work. Now this is very disturbing from a scientific point of view because science is a social activity. We, it's a collaborative activity, certainly at this level, uh, where you have lots of data, big problems, and you need expertise of different people to really build a team that can address these issues. And we need to build on each other's work rather than protecting others from getting our uh, software. I mean, I can really understand why he says that, because now it's actually a huge amount of work to build the kinds of models that produce this sort of information, and we need to make that process easier. Um, so NOVA is our solution to containing this tiger that we all want to ride. Um, and part of that solution is to promote a collaborative community of model builders. NOVA is a highly expressive visual language, and we think that this will set new standards of information exchange. It, uh, as Richard will explain, it promotes process thinking, which we believe will lead to a better trained generation of applied scientists. Um, it will also allow rapid prototyping and accurate coding, which we believe will la lead to best modeling practices and reproducible science. And finally, um, efficient development of research models, uh, which in the context of NOVA will lead to reusable libraries, pedigreed methods, code sharing. Those of you who know R and its toolboxes have seen how this has promoted statistical um, applications in ecology, sociology, and other fields. We think NOVA is going to be able to do all this if it's the right platform. We believe it is. So in promoting a collaborative computational community of applied scientists, what we're most interested in doing is uh, firstly teaching NOVA in college courses, and we're already doing this at uh, Oberlin and Berkeley. Um, we're also trying to bring NOVA, because of its ease to start out building very easy small mod models, uh, to the high school classroom, and Nick's going to talk about our success in this particular area. At this time, we're planning local and international NOVA workshops, and we're doing this by forming an international consortium to enhance all aspects of NOVA. And uh, Richard will show you the different components, um, the IDE interface, uh, the plugins and libraries, and how we put these things together. So at this time, this international consortium consists of, it's very informal, it's not a formal consortium at this point, but we have collaborators uh, in South Africa at UKZN, where I have an appointment, uh, colleagues in Israel, in Norway, uh, we hope to develop more partners in India, we have partners in Germany and also in Spain. 
So Nova is supposed to be this easy entry platform with spectacular power. And uh, Richard's going to show us why. Here we go. So I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the uh, structure of Nova, show you a few examples, and give you a feel for the approach that we're taking um, in, in this platform. Uh, at the uh, risk of being a little bit glib, um, I, tried to, I, I, I like to think that what we're try attempting is a, a uh, poke at the architecture of computational thinking. So um, the challenge really is boiled down into two, uh, two parts. First of all, to create a design platform whose components express the abstract structure of dynamical systems. So in other words, we want to create some kind of visual metaphor that is uh, appropriate for the kinds of systems that we're, that we're building. But at the same time, we want to provide the tools that promote the best practices of program design. And as somebody who's been involved in programming, uh, myself for the last many, many years, um, I have a sense that, that there, are, there are good and there are less good ways to build programs. And I'd like, I'm hoping that what we, what we do here is try to provide that same ethic, in a sense, to this new milieu, this, this new area. So the kinds of models we're talking about um, really fall into three categories. First, there's system dynamics, which uh, has, was invented around or, or formulated around 1956, uh, is exemplified by these stock and flow networks. Uh, the stock and flow networks are actually visual representations of differential equations. And simulations that use these networks are, in fact, uh, what they are doing is numerical integration. But fortunately, the uh, designer doesn't really have to think that way. All what they, the designer thinks about is uh, that they have a reservoir, they have a flow into or possibly out of that reservoir, that the flow has a certain rate, and effectively, they're dealing, although they're dealing with derivatives, they don't necessarily have to be formulating their thoughts that way. Uh, in particular, uh, things get interesting when there's feedback. In fact, they're, let's say they're not interesting at all if there isn't much feedback. But most of these systems do have some, some form of feedback. And so the, the, that, that uh, is expressed very directly in terms of the diagrams. Now, to, 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 in addition to the system dynamics, we're also talking about another, sort, another domain of um, modeling. And that is the domain of spatial and agent-based models. Spatial models, uh, if you're familiar with cellular automata, like the game of life, uh, then you've seen, uh, you, you've seen something of what I'm talking about. Uh, cellular automata uh, represents some form of topology, namely that these are uh, each of the cells in a cellular automata has some sort of individual state transition rule. And uh, these cells, uh, that rule may depend upon something uh, that's going on in the neighborhood. So topological considerations uh, enter in. Uh, adding to that, we have agent-based, where we're talking now about individuals that can uh, similarly uh, have in internal states, but they also interact with each other. There are uh, births and deaths, uh, possibly, and uh, they may interact with their environment. OK. So NOVA is a single framework to capture this eclectic set of systems. Okay? And I'd like to think that the expressive power that we're, going, that, we, that we're seeing as we build NOVA models derives from these uh, properties of good programming, namely modularity, the ability to, to isolate and modularize various parts and interchangeably slip them in, pull them out, and so forth, abstraction, and extensibility. Okay, so here's, the, here's a, a, a quick look at the NOVA architecture. Uh, we start uh, down here uh, with a design platform, um, a, a visual design platform uh, on which we are able to construct models using the visual component language. Uh, this design platform supports multiple levels, and as a result, the component language is able to support um, uh, various forms of abstraction and aggregation. Now the model that is created visually on this platform is captured and turned into a script uh, in a language called NovaScript. NovaScript is a, an embedding of, a, of a, is embedded in JavaScript so that it's a complete JavaScript 
language interpreter with additional object types that represent the abstract elements of, of, these, of these models. The, mo the running or the simulation actually is equivalent to running the NovaScript program on what I would call the NovaScript runtime environment, which is similarly the JavaScript runtime environment with these additional, with these additional elements. At various points in time, there is going to be some kind of display. You're going to want to display graphs, or you're going to want to display uh, various vi uh, possible visualizations. And so we then reflect back to the, uh, to the, uh, dis to the, to the uh, display uh, element, which we call the dashboard, and uh, which includes various different kinds of display uh, entities. Um, so what I want to do now is switch to a, um, a uh, go over to this demo. This is a, an example of what a NOVA, of, of a very simple NOVA uh, model looks like. This is a model of, a po of population growth. This is kind of the hello world of the uh, system dynamics modeling. And so we have a population that is, encaps that is represented by this stock. It, 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 we're, not, we're only modeling births, so we have births that uh, uh, represents the rate of change in which the population uh, of, the, of the population, the births are themselves uh, determined by the current population times a rate factor, and this is what gives us the exponential growth that we're familiar with. So, if I uh, in, uh, construct this uh, model this way, we have graphs on this side. This is the dashboard side, and what I do is say uh, to run it is to capture load exec. We set up some time uh, 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 time uh, uh, constraints here. We determine a DT for the numerical integration and an integration method, and we uh, run the model. And we get we get this graph. Now the actual model is contained here in this Nova script. So this is the the model has been, that has been captured and turned into a script and is actually running on this Nova script. Uh, we present a console here, so you can actually interactively uh, uh, probe the model, find out. Uh, you could single step it, you could ask for different values along the way and so forth, which I'm not going to do now. Now, another um, interesting thing you can do with this, uh, well, if, for, from a teaching point of view, is you can put it into a mode where if you change the rate, you immediately run the model and you can get instant feedback on how things change. So we're, we're thinking in terms of, of a very good educational user interface uh, aspects. Now. I'm going to eliminate some parts here. I'm going to show you a trans make a do a transformation. Uh, and by the way, what I'm showing you here is not new. Uh, Stella, uh, Vensim, Berkeley Madonna, they all implement systems that are like this. But what I'm about to show you I think is new. Um, so let me, let me get rid of this. I'm going to convert this rate um, slight into from a, a value. I'm going to convert it into a pin. I'm going to add a pin, which we'll call pop out. Uh, I'm going to now run an arrow from here to pop out, because what I'm going to do in pop out is just, rep is just present the population. And so these pins represent input and output ports to this model. So think about this model now all by itself. Um, what if so, so the next step is to create a, sec a new layer, which I do by clicking here. And so now we have the lower layer, which contains the original model. We now have this upper layer. And I can now pull this out and create an encapsulated version of the original model at this higher layer. The original model is inside. And you'll notice that the pins that are sticking out here correspond precisely to the pins that, that, are, that are shown here. So now, once again, I can, um, uh, I can, I can add a, 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 I can add a, a graph. We'll just call it, you know, pop graph. And I can connect this, uh, connect this graph. And I think, in the interest of time, I've kind of already done this in a in, in a an existing model. We we add this here. Um, and um, we have to add something to control the control the uh, the 
rate, so we have that. And we connect that over here. And now, once again, we have, um, we have the same model we had before, but now the model exists at a different level. Now, I could, what's interesting about this is that if I want, I can create two instances of that model. And that's what I've done here. So I've got two instances of the same model um, at this, this upper level. And I can change the different rates here. And we see, the, see, it, see it, this one only affects the second one. This one affects the first one. So in other words, we can have multiple instances of the model. And that's you know, not something that's unfamiliar to programmers because, in fact, we write subprograms and we do this sort of thing um, all the time. So, um, so what I showed you that we had a, originally the, the original model I call the capsule. This is a capsule where I've added the pins. And now you can see that in this, in this situation, I've embedded this capsule into this chip. And the chip um, represents the, the submodel at the higher level. So another way of looking at this is that we've created a kind of a third dimension to the design. So instead of being a flat design, we now have a three-dimensional design. And just to point out that this, too, can be embedded in something higher. And so uh, we can go as high as we want in terms of this kind of vertical design. Now, what do you do with that kind of thing? Well, there might be a, good, there might be a number of interesting things you can do. In particular, you could represent a spatial grid. So I, I could have a bunch of chips, and I can line them up in horizontal and vertical uh, rows and columns, and I can think of those as actually being some sort of positional thing. Uh, or I can also think of them as a set of agents. Now, the people who came up with Stella thought of this kind of, uh, of themselves some time ago. Um, in Hannon's book from 2001, he proposed spatial modeling in Stella, and this is the picture that he came up with. So what we have is a single model where he's done a kind of cut and paste. And he's cut and paste the same model over and over again. And then he has to hook up the various pieces. Uh, it's interesting that he actually had his grad student do this rather than doing it himself. And this is what was proposed as a spatial model. And notice that we only are able to get nine different, uh, nine different you know, a, a three by three grid, which isn't very much. So. Um, so this is, not a, this is certainly not a particularly good solution. But in fact, the chip solution is not a great, for this particular case, would not be a great solution if you wanted to have, say, 10 by 10. You'd have to manage a grid of 10 by 10 chips. So in fact, the better thing to do is to think in terms of more advanced containers. And um, I'm going to uh, demonstrate that with some examples. Uh, I think there's probably only time for two of the examples. So I'll just do the first and the, and the last to show you a spatial model and then a, a spatial and agent-based model. And the, uh, by the way, the Nova ships with a whole set of um, a, a model library. And all of the examples I'm showing you are in that model library. So um, let me load up the, the first example. This is called the fire spread example. And it's kind of a, it's a cellular, um, it's kind of like the game of life in a way. But what we're representing is a forest with trees. The trees can either be green, on fire, or burned. And the rule, the transition rules are fairly simple, namely that if you are a tree that's next to a, a tree that's on fire, then there's a probability that you might catch fire. If you catch fire, you burn for one time unit, and then you burn out, and then you can't be burned anymore. Now, to make it interesting, we also add in a, uh, this blue uh, firewall. But to make the firewall interesting, we add some holes. So. Uh, if I run this, there we go, we can ask ourselves, well, how often are we going to go through, how we go, is the firewall going to hold? And how does that relate to the probability of a, of a burn? Then we can repeat this. OK? We haven't gotten through yet. Fire burned out. If I, if I, obviously, if I up the probability, we would expect more, worse things will happen. All right, so what, are we, what is this model built out of? Well, it's built out of a grid of, I think it's 50 by 50, so 2,500 cells. Each cell is, in fact, a model similar to the original, to the, to the model that I showed you before. Namely, we have a state, which is represented by the tree. The state can be one of three, four possibilities. 
either unburned, burn, burning, burned, or a firewall. And then we have the lot, and, and now we're at a point where we have to do something that departs from what system dynamics gives us. In system dynamics, there is so much semantics built into the basic structure of the stock and flow, namely the fact that you're using an integrator, that all you have to do is represent the stock and the flow and kind of the system kind of takes over at that point. But, it, but for these more advanced models, we're actually going to have to specify what we want to have happen. We have to specify that logic. And that's where things get hard, because specifying logic means programming. We can make that a, a, a somewhat less daunting task if we can take the pieces of program and then represent them visually and represent them in terms of, the, of, of, of functionality. So in here, uh, this, I, I have, uh, in, uh, this element here is what is called a program chip. And a program chip, uh, or a code chip, I guess it's a, co it's a code chip. And a code chip is, 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 is the, it represents a function, or it can represent, actually, you can have fields, so it, can, it really represents an object. It also can represent a higher order function, so you can actually define a function that can then be exported out of the sort of the way you might do it in the Lisper scheme. And uh, the code chip contains the logic for one definable uh, part of the model. Namely, in this case, it contains the logic for how burning, um, uh, what the, the logic for burning. So we have input, we input the current value of the tree, what its state is, the probability of burning, and then something about neighbors. Now, neighbors is an important part of this. Namely, we're only going to burn if our neighbors are burning. So what we have to do is compute uh, uh, the, the neighbors, and that requires another code chip. So we create a code chip which simply says, here are my coordinates, who are my neighbors? I just iterate through uh, a, a nested loop and I can compute my own neighbors. So I compute my neighbors here, the neighbors are stored here and then are ready to be cons consulted over here. So this model uh, visually presents how the, the, the logic of the system, and the, the beauty part of this is that if somebody else needs to compute their neighbors, your friend, you could take this part of the model, export it to them, and they could just include it. In fact, all of these things are, are exportable. All of the code, the code chips, the capsules, and so forth, are all exportable and, and archivable. So once the functionality has been defined, it becomes a black box that you can, if, if, it's been, if it becomes trustworthy, then, in fact, you can use it again and again. OK. So yeah. <coughs> Submodel is in. I mean, is that fire spread layer on top? Does that actually contain instances of this thing? I'm about to talk about the containers right now. Right, I see an abstraction violation here, where the you know, the bottommost level needs to know about neighbors, and neighbors needs to know that it's in a container that has this kind. That's of right. Thing. That's right. So, so are you going to talk about that in a bit? Uh, the it, it, neighbors, if you look closely, what's happening is that they're primitive operators that are uh, provided. And those primitive operators are only going to be valid if, in fact, the, the capsule is part of the container. Yeah, right. So you're basically making a call to your container to get that information. I, I mean, that's a little, more, a little more in the weeds that I wanted to get into. But that's, if I showed you the code for neighbors, let me show you uh, just quickly to answer your question. Right, I, mean, I know it's super.matrix. Something, something. Right, yes. But I mean, you know, is that a generically it seems that that's pretty much uh, assuming that, okay, maybe we have a rectangular layout, maybe what if we had a hexagonal grid instead of a... Uh, well, then we would, have, we would abstract this in a different, possibly abstract this in a different way. But this is depending upon the fact that this is going to be used inside the container. Right. And, and more, you know, more precisely, it seems that it's, it's very dependent on the container type, which seems to be a bit of a strong coupling between the model, you know, the, the piece that's the tree sensing logic mm -hmm. and the kind of container that that's embedded in. So we, I'm just wondering how, how it's possible to um, better abstract the tree and its sensing of what's going on around it, if there's going to be more generic way to do Well, there, there, there could very well be. I mean, this is, this is tailored to this particular model. So we're going to be, for example, our next one of the things that we're going to be looking at are more generic containers, where the, uh, the notion of neighbor becomes a more abstract concept. Okay, and it doesn't necessarily depend on the fact that it's a Cartesian grid. Okay, but in this case, we, we are, and, and you know, uh, that's, that's, that, that's cool. okay? okay. Um, 
But I'm, that's, I'm glad you noticed that. I mean, that's, that's, that's really the, the, the idea is we have a container. The container provides services to its, its constituents. And the constituents will use those services. And we want to make those services as abstract as possible. OK? So that is a goal. Um, so actually, here is the container. There's not much to look at. Uh, but this, as, a, you know, uh, as, as you have sort of teased out, uh, the fact is that we've got, the, we've got these containers that uh, do provide a particular set of services and a particular topology. The cell matrix gives you is a, effectively a two-dimensional array. So the idea of a, of a pair of coordinates is a natural thing for this. The agent vector uh, is a one-dimensional array, but it adds additional uh, capability involving position and also births and deaths. And then the simulation world combines the two. It combines the cell matrix and the agent vector so that the world that the agents are moving in is, in fact, the world that is defined by the cell matrix, and the agents can interact with their, with their ground. And I'll show you an example of that right now. Um, Well, we had some questions. OK, so here, this is the wolf-sheep predation. And what you have here, the wolves are in red. The sheep are in blue. Uh, we also have grass growing. The sheep eat the grass. Um, here, we're using a sim world. OK, and um, this is our grass, where we have growth and we have eaten. And this rep point represents a communication point between an a the agent, that is, the agent that might be occupying that cell and the cell itself. Um, the agent is the most complicated part because it actually impersonates both a wolf and a sheep. Uh, at this point, the, at this particular point in NOVA development, the agent is a, uh, there's only one, you can only put one type of agent in an agent vector, but we're working on having uh, a, a, a uh, multiple flavor type of representation, but you can always do it by, through a mode, which is what we do here. You, you come up with a type, and that it's either a sheep or it's a wolf, and that's different, uh, different f functionalities are going to be swapped in. So sheep energy, here's where the, we, we deal with sheep eating grass. Um, here's where we deal with sheep, uh, be, wolves eating, sh uh, uh, killing sheep. Um, here are code chips that, that comp uh, compute all of that. Here is a mover. This is a generic mover that's used in a lot of different models that turns uh, polar to rectangular coordinates. So um, uh, we talked about code chips. And then the last thing is plugins. And plugins are uh, a way of extending the, the Nova platform with actual Java uh, extensions that uh, talk to an API. So all of the visualization. Uh, elements that you saw there are examples of plugins. Now I have one more. I have one more example that I think it illustrates the the granularity of model structure that Nova actually sort of forces you to think about. Uh, so here, this model is a four-layer model, and at the bottom layer, we have one kind of thing happening. Namely, we have a fission event. So, um, a rather fission or die. So, if I exec this model, we're thinking of, a, of an individual that does one of three possible things. It either persists the way it is at, at one, or it goes to zero, or it goes to two. And we, we identify zero as dying and two as fissioning. Okay? So, here's this is an event driven, an event uh, driven mo or an event oriented model. You take this one layer up, and you, you use what's called a clock chip. And a clock chip adds to a chip, the ordinary chip, the ability to actually have its own clock. So that one tick at this level then becomes an entire simulation at the level below. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this happening. And we're going to repeat the experiment some number, say, 10 times, and use a histogram to show what is the, uh, you know, what, what happens over those 10 different simulations. The histogram is an example of a plugin, uh, one, one, of the, one, one example of a plugin that, that does the function of a histogram. Uh, at this level now, we're going to actually 
uh, take those elements and create a, an agent space in which the uh, behavior plays out so that we're going to, in fact, see a population trajectory of uh, watching starting, say, with 100 individuals and going through this fission and die or die uh, process. We're going to watch the growth and decay of the population. So it goes from 100 up to 130 and so forth. Now, I think we have the probability of fissioning and dying as the same here. So in fact, it's going to be a fairly random process. And at the next level up, we're going to do a statistical analysis. So what we're going to do now is, once again, using a clock chip, is going to repeat the experiment, um, say, 100 times. And we're going to accumulate, we're going to, we're going to, to accumulate st statistics down here. Uh, namely the, uh, me the, the mean and standard deviation, and we watch actually as this is done over and over again, then in fact this gets very smooth. So each of these is a, is, is shows process logic of a different type that is played on the level below. Each of them is a different kind of, of, of process. It's, uh, it's certainly clear that one could write a Java program or a JavaScript program to do this. It's not a complicated model. But what, was really, what really shows up here is how these different layers actually are distinct and how they interact with each other. In other words, the actual architecture of the model is much clearer here than you would actually see in, if, the, if, if you were just coding it up. You can also take any of these layers and possibly plug something else in and, and, and use them in a different model. So I'm going to complete my talk with just a few, um, a little bit about the future. So a couple of things, two very important things we want to do is we want to be able to interact with other platforms. We are already interacting with the R platform. And um, we are, in a limited way, we also want to be able to use uh, GIS data for our, to, to program our spatial, our spatial uh, models. And very important is we want to be able to create curated archives and libraries of capsules, code chips, and plugins so that we can create an entire set of tools, say, for Wayne's domain, for, for population biology. We could create another set of tools and create communities that use these tools, enhance these tools, and are, are actually interacting over the sort of the ecology of, of, of NOVA. Um, another very important aspect in terms of ramping up is to be able to uh, use high-performance computing and NOVA is really quite uh, architecturally pro appropriate because, in fact, we have NOVA script, and then we also have the, the visualizing and uh, design platforms, and they're separate. And so, for example, the NOVA script could run on a server, and there could be interactions between uh, uh, clients on a laptop or on a, mobile, or on a mobile platform. Now, I haven't had much of a chance to talk about NOVA script itself, but there's a paper uh, that uh, you can download that actually gives some details about the scripting language. Uh, there are some people who've actually just gone and written NovaScript programs without actually using the visual uh, domain. So I'm done. Um, so we're going to try to bridge the gap between education and uh, the research right now, which is uh, clinical trial simulation um, to reduce mortality in Africa, childhood mortality in Africa. and. Um, Rich touched on this as a, as a NOVA user. Um, this is how I think about NOVA in terms of how it's useful for me. It's a domain-specific visual language, and the domain is modeling in all its different capacities. And not only that, we actually can reach down into um, some high-level scripting languages and get more expressiveness than we would have in the visual domain. And if we really need to, or if we have something that we really like, we can reach down to lower-level la language stuff and develop plugins and tools in Java. But the, the productivity and the, the process thinking and the accessibility happens up here at the domain-specific visual side. And I think that's really where NOVA shines. So on the education side, there, there is a new set of national standards. The National Research Council of the Academy of Sciences has released two documents. One is called the Framework for K-12 through Education. The other is the Next Generation Science Standards. Um, these are designed to inform state standards. And states are going to use this stuff to figure out what they want to do um, in terms of their state school systems. And uh, what I'm going to show next is a, a reasonably complicated articulation of how they view the scientific process. And I'm going to highlight where NOVA fits in this um, framework. But the notion is that you have the real world where you have real world data. 
um, where you're able to collect data and test solutions. And then you have theories and models on the other side, and you use theories and models to help you formulate hypotheses and propose solutions. And what we do in the education setting with NOVA is we actually allow students to interact with theories and models in a more intuitive and integrated way. We allow them to explore and formulate hypotheses using those computational models. And the, the exciting bit is that we actually let them collect data and test solutions in a simulation environment. And where NOVA really shines is when we actually introduce real world components and we actually have the whole scientific process happening quickly uh, in a computational form for students. And that's our, that's our approach to this. We want to link all these things together. So our objective here was to develop a three-day lesson that an instructor could implement in class that would teach infectious disease principles, because that's my background, that's the background of the funding agency, um, and computational modeling principles. And then we wanted to engage students in that intuitive, rapid cycle scientific process, and we wanted to focus on global infectious disease. So what we've done so far is we've did a, we did a pilot at Castilea in the fall. And the pilot was in two biology classrooms at Castilea. We did a second revision of that lesson at the Bay School in San Francisco. And um, just three weeks ago, we did a public pilot uh, at Aptos High down in, uh, on the other side of the Santa Cruz Mountains in a health class. So not in a biology class and not in an experimental biology setting, but in a health and how, how can I use a model to understand my decisions and health, the health consequences of those decisions. So, we're, we're exploring this in a couple different realms and we're seeing good things. And we've presented the results that we have um, at the California Association of Independent Schools. Janae and I did a presentation there and there was a lot of enthusiasm for these kinds of tools. Um, and then we also presented them at the UC San Francisco uh, Academy of Medical Educators Annual Education Symposium. And something very interesting happened where people in the medical education world said, if you can introduce computational modeling tools and data intensive applications to high school students, it would be great if we could do that with our medical students because that's what we need to train our medical students to do in the future. So everywhere we go presenting what we do, we get enthusiastic responses and people really see potential. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on what we actually do in these classrooms because you can't just hand students a model, have them play with it and have them come out with discovery. Um, you actually need to introduce students in an uh, organic or intuitive way to what we're doing. And the way we do that is we start with a very simple lesson called the circle game, which is an interactive, intuitive experience where students are all sitting in a circle and one of them starts sick. And they have a local contact neighborhood. We don't describe it that way. We say, look, two neighbors to your left and two neighbors to your right. Count how many people are sick. And we give them a, a rule that they execute with a die. And they essentially execute the algorithm of a computational model of infectious disease live in class. And none of this is, is introduced as computational modeling at the outset, but they are essentially doing a computational simulation. They're, they're the nodes of the simulation. And we show them that exact same process using the simulation software, and now all of a sudden we've mapped a real world experience that they had where they were looking at an infectious disease to the computational model. And not only that, we can run this multiple times, we can explore it iteratively, and we can see different trajectories of infection. In this setup of the game, people are healthy, they get sick, they never get better. And so over time, you see that everybody ends up in that infectious state. And this is a great moment for students to offer their alternate interpretations of how infectious disease works. And they can say, well, you know, chicken pox, people get better and they get resistant and they're immune. Uh, you know, other diseases, you get sick and then you get better. And we actually are able to implement those other rules of the game to see how they change the infectious disease process. And students are providing the idea. We're showing them computationally how that plays out. So students immediately in that first lesson, we're just trying to build a foundation for them to understand what a computational model is. And we do it with experience and we do it intuitively. We send them home with a homework assignment where we assign them a disease in small groups and they parse out uh, some of the parameters that you might use for these infectious diseases. Um, and they, they go out and they realize that the real world is messy, that you, you can't necessarily figure out you know, all the time how many contacts somebody is, is going to have for measles, for instance, or what the transmission probability is. But they go out and they get real world data. Um, and they come back for lesson two. Well, and this is what the data looks like, and we provide the instructors with a background on measles. What would be appropriate parameters for measles? How are these documented so instructors are in a good place for this? So we have a foundation, we have real world data, and that's where we're able to actually do the computational modeling. We've cushioned and set students up to succeed, and they do things, um, well, they launch it on a web page. They do things like this. 
And what we have here is a simulation of measles where we're looking at um, how the uh, frequency and size of the outbreak changes when vaccination rates are changed. And students are given this model. They have four parameters that they can change, and those are set up in sliders, and Rich showed what those look like. And we're actually starting with a high level of resistance. So imagine high vaccine coverage, 95% vaccine coverage. And instead of being in a static fixed network, the agents are actually moving around. Students are able to map this and realize we're getting closer to the real world. This is how people might actually mingle for measles. Um, and they can change parameters. And so in this demo, we changed the parameter of, of vaccine coverage from 95% to 70%, and you see epidemics play out. And we have good visualizations of what that data looks like. Students are, are able to work with this stuff in a couple different ways, and they're able to do it interactively. They're able to see the animation. They're able to see the data. So it's a powerful tool for letting students uh, get an easy and, and powerful introduction to what computational modeling is in infectious disease. So we um, scoot on, and uh, when I was showing this to, to my partner last night, she said, this is a death by PowerPoint slide. You have you know, an entire paragraph of text sitting up there. And the reason why I have this up here is because this is what a student responded to in our Castellet lesson. We said, write a concluding paragraph and put in you know, what parameters you did and what significance it has to the real world. You know, give, it, give it your best shot. This is our pilot lesson. And you see that the student says, if resistance goes from 95% to 85% in a town with a population of 100, so they're quantifying their simulation. Um, they have incubation times and infectious times in there. How does that affect the number of people who get measles? And they, they in, you know, in two lessons, or in three lessons, they're able to connect their simulation to the real world, and they're able to say something like, from the answer to this question, we learned that if towns had an 85% resistance rate instead of 95, um, you could have a mini epidemic. So I think our lesson is successful for the students, and this is a great indicator of, of how what we're trying to do is actually getting through to them. Um, and this was in our pilot lesson. Things have really improved in a lot of ways since then. We did a public school pilot and we actually did some pre-post analysis. We asked students to define a computational model on the way in. We had a couple students who nailed it right on. Um, we asked them to define one on the way out. 93% of students got it. We had a couple students who just, you know, the whole lesson went by, they didn't get it and it didn't work for them. We also asked um, how this simulation exercise or this simulation lesson uh, affects their um, understanding of infectious disease. And we had a lot of students reporting that the, the model helped them understand something about staying home when you're sick or getting treatment and antibiotics and how that might affect um, infectious disease or vaccination. So it looks like we have a lesson that's working really well for students. Really what we need to focus on now is a lesson that works well for teachers. And our expert instructor that we worked with in our public pilot said anytime he's presented with new content, it's a five minute test. He needs, to have, he needs to know what he's going to do and what his students are going to do in five minutes. And if he can figure that out, he'll spend the rest of the time actually putting the lesson together. And what we have right now, we want to really work towards executing that five-minute test. So we have something that works for students. We have something that we need to improve and, and make better for instructors, because instructors are the, the, the limiting reagent in the whole reaction. So we want to pass that five-minute test. Um, teachers want to use these lessons. Uh, in the fall and in the spring. They want to develop their own lessons in the future and we're going to be able to continue doing this and we're going to put the documentation and the assignment sheets and all the support materials to pass that five minute test online. So I'm going to change gears. Well, I'm going to thank the people who we work with. This is part of something called the Model Infectious Disease Agent Study. That's the NIH group who does this infectious disease research stuff. So now I'm going to go to the other end. We're using NOVA to help understand how we might reduce childhood mortality in Africa. And, and I, I'm laying this out to, to sort of show the scope of what we're doing with this tool. Um, and what you need to know here is that to, to reduce mortality in Africa, what you do is a cluster randomized clinical trial where you provide treatment to some communities, you provide a placebo to other communities. The randomization unit is the community. And you try to observe if there's a, a significant effect or a significant difference between some outcome variable in those randomized communities, and that might be malaria, pneumococcus, or malnutrition. So what we do with NOVA is we actually pull spatial coordinates for where these villages are that are in the trial. And, and Google Maps is a great tool for this because you, you realize that you can actually get very high resolution on what these communities look like. You're getting census data on the ground for, um, for the villages, and you're able to actually verify that census data with a, a high resolution picture. You're able to say, you know, does this look like a 7,000 person village or a 300 person village? And you're able to verify and validate your, your data, and we're able to use that data in our simulation. So uh, this is 
Um, this is not the trial area that we're working in, and, and the trial that we're working in is in planning stages, so I can't show that stuff. This is somewhere else, and we're using this as a demo. And these are communities uh, randomized into, into control and treatment. And you can imagine that there are actually different mortality factors, say, along this cluster here, which is along a waterway, versus these more sparsely uh, located populated areas, probably in the highlands and probably further away from water sources. And if your clinical trial is trying to figure out how you're um, intervening and what your intervention looks like in these different environments, that's, that's an important thing to think about. And every single one of these communities is actually um, a child uh, submodel uh, aggregated at the community level and then reproductions of those aggregates um, in a spatially relevant context. And what we get is a simulation that when we animate it looks something like this. And what we're looking at in that yellow color is the incidence of invasive disease. So this would be the disease state right before a mortality event happens. And this would be the place where an intervention would reduce mortality. And what we actually are simulating here is every six months some treatment is interjected into the treatment groups. And that treatment doesn't exist in the control groups. And you can actually lay out and simulate your whole clinical trial and test out different uh, hypotheses or assumptions that you have about the, uh, the underlying population region. Um, and it's a, it's a great tool for exploring and making some simulation-based decisions about how you're going to plan a clinical trial that you, you want to succeed. And essentially what we're doing is we're just trying to map. Do, um, do these control villages here map to reduction of mortality here? Um, and NOVA's nice because we aren't actually doing the statistics um, in JavaScript, which is the, the underlying language, the scripting language, we're actually using R for that. So we take all the simulation data. Nova's playing nice with R. We, we do our statistical analysis over there. We pipe it back over. Um, and you can see this is what we're really trying to get at uh, with our clinical trial simulations, which is what's the power of the study? Uh, how often would we see the effect of the treatment if an actual effect exists? And, and uh, to, to close off more or less, this is what the model actually looks like. There's script involved in here, but the components that we're using for this simulation are really the same components that Rich uh, was able to show at the beginning. And we actually have an infectious disease state here. We have the child here, which includes that infectious disease state. We're aggregating children at this level. Um, and then we're aggregating communities here. And we actually have multiple levels of aggregation. You're aggregating an aggregate. And we're really using that hierarchical structure of NOVA to successfully implement this simulation. And it's relatively visually intelligible. You, if you organize it and if you're able to communicate it well, you can use the, 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 the flow and the visual to express what you're doing. So, uh, you know, the breadth of NOVA. You can do stuff in K-12 education. You can do stuff to reduce mortality in Africa. I think more pertinent than that is actually that we're trying to introduce tools at the K-12 level that people can then use to help uh, resolve some of the most complicated issues that we're faced with today, like development and mortality um, in Africa. And you start in high school with an introduction to it. You're able to use the same tool as you progress through your higher education, and you're able to take it to innovation and research. And it, it's, a, it's a tool that works at both ends of the spectrum and can push and accelerate students uh, along their path. So thanks for giving us the opportunity. And, and how much of a programmer were you before you came to NOVA? Yeah, so if I put myself on this spectrum, I was introduced to NOVA at the higher education level. And in two years of working with it, three years of working with it, I was able to accelerate to that innovation and research level where we're doing useful things for real people in practice. Nick is not a, C, he's not a CS guy. Okay, or he wasn't you. a CS guy. Thank you.